I'm Ross Ihaka, um, Narika Hanganu, Rangatane, um, which is from the Wairarapa region, which is of course a place I've never actually lived, although I've spent a little time there. Right. So take me back to your childhood. Where did you grow up? Um, I was born in Waiuku, um, but my parents didn't actually live in Waiuku. They lived in a small country area outside there. Um, my parents were country school teachers and we moved around a lot. So from there, they moved to Pyroar um, and then to Elfriston in South Auckland and then to Rarotonga um, and then to Russell and finally Whangarei, which is where they finally settled down. So did you have much connection to your Māori roots growing up at all? No, not really. Um, that was partly because we were so far from, you know, where the iwi is uh, and partly just because it was so rural, there really weren't many people around. Um, I, see, I remember a couple of farming families in the neighbourhood, but that was about it. And so as a kid, were you interested in data or statistics, maths at all? Um, none of that really. Uh, I had a bit of an interest in nature. Um, uh, we lived in Rarotonga for a while and essentially the, the kids in Rarotonga ran feral. Um, and so we spent most of our time either in the ocean or up in the hills exploring. Um, it was a great place to be a kid. Um, so, you know, I developed an interest in nature, but nothing technical at that point. Mm -hmm. I got interested in science at um, high school, so I was interested in chemistry and physics. Uh, at the schools I was at, we didn't really have a specialist mathematics teacher. The mathematics was taught by a chemist, um, so it was always kind of an add-on to anything else that was going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I wasn't very good at it. Right, okay. Was it sort of a bit more rote learning, if you like, rather than, I don't know, anything deeper than that? Is that perhaps um, why you sort of felt like it didn't interest you at that point? Going back to primary school, I remember kids chanting the times table, <laughs> which was kind of a thing. I missed out on that um, because I sw swapped schools at the wrong point at the school I was at, it hadn't been done yet. At the school I went to, it had already been done, so I missed out on learning my times tables, um, which was probably a good thing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Put you off even more, maybe. Well, it means you have to work out the answers. They don't just come instantly to mind. Um, and so working things out is always a good exercise. And so you initially went off to university with the intention of studying biology, is that correct? Um, physics. Physics, okay. Me. I was all set to be a physicist and in about my second or third week I found out I was no good at doing practical experiments. Um, so setting out to be a physicist I dropped physics after about a month of university. And then switched to... And then I was sort of at a loss. I was doing chemistry and mathematical subjects. I thought I might do cell biology or something like that. Um, but again, I didn't enjoy the practical side of these things. And I got interested in mathematics during my first year. Um, just because it sort of started to make sense to me. In what way? You know, you know that one and one is two, and two and two is four, but you don't necessarily know why that is. And you can give a formal proof of that. It runs to hundreds of pages. Um, but I was more interested in the why than the answer you got. Um, and that was starting to be explained in first year mathematics at university. Mm -hmm. And so then you decided that you specialised in statistics, is that kind of how that pathway worked? Um, initially I was doing pure mathematics um, because there's kind of a macho thing in, among mathematicians that the, pure you, pure you, the more pure you are, the better you are. Um, but at the same time I was doing some courses in statistics because I did realise I wasn't going to be a great mathematician. Um, and you know, that proved to be the case. I eventually followed up doing more and more statistics. Mm. 
And so why did you feel like you weren't going to be a great mathematician? What was it about maths that sort of pushed you down more down the stats path? I just wasn't that good at it. There, there were people around me who were clearly much better at it. Um, and I'm practical enough to realize, you know, it was going to be frustrating and I would have to work too hard at it to, to be any good at it. Whereas, you know, doing something like statistics, you could be of practical use, you know, even if you didn't know that much about it. Mm. So to, you know, in layman's terms, I guess, what exactly, how would you describe statistics? It's really the study of information, meaning quantitative information, and how you use it. Um, whether it be to understand some situation or to predict ahead what's going to happen. Uh, I guess those are the main things. Un in insight and um, the ability to predict what will happen. And so what sort of person typically becomes a statistician? Weirdos, I guess. <laughs> um, it's not... It's not a career that anyone sets out to be in, or at least there can't be many, or maybe maybe there are now, but when I was young, there weren't. It was something you drifted into. So people who had some aptitude for mathematics, generally who started out in the physical sciences, but like me, they weren't very practical, or you know maybe they just didn't like killing things if they were in the biological sciences. Um, and so you kind of drift into it from various points of view. Um, I think I've only ever met one person who said that they had always wanted to be a statistician. <laughs> and so you went off to the University of California, Berkeley um, to do graduate school. Why did you, why did you decide to go there? Um, well, you um, you apply to a number of universities, that's the strategy, and you, you go to the best one that accepts you. Um, and I was lucky enough to have uh, had some contact with one of the professors from there. He was visiting Auckland um, a year or two before I applied there, and I think he put in a good word for me, and that's what got me in there. Mm. Um, but did you, you wanted to travel overseas for a purpose? You didn't want to do a PhD at, um, in Auckland? Um, I wasn't really thinking about doing a PhD. It seemed like a good excuse to go and have six months holiday somewhere and then think about what it was I really wanted to do. Um, I thought I would be very much out of my league there. Um, but when I got there, I found it was just people like me um, and I could hold my own, I guess. You did graduate school, right? So that meant you did a master's and yeah. then that went on to a PhD. And so what sort of work were you looking at at that point in time? Um, well, you know, before I actually started the PhD, I was just looking around at the subject in general. Um, the, the PhD itself was actually on problems in seismology. So um, an earthquake happens somewhere under the ground. You make a recording of the way the ground moves somewhere else, you want to be able to relate that ground movement to what actually happened under the ground. So, you know, how much rock fractured, how much energy was released, that sort of thing. So the work I did was sort of relating the measurements back to what was happening underground. Mm. And your PhD title actually had a Māori name. Yeah, Ro Umoko, who's the god of earthquakes in the underworld, I guess. Um, and so did, with that work, did you use computers very much at that point in time? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, any kind of statistical work of any substance requires computers just because the volume of information is so big. Um, you know, with earthquake recordings, you're making a measurement every hundredth of a second and it can go on for minutes. So you end up with lots and lots of information and the techniques for actually analysing it are, are quite complex. Um, so you need that support to do things. So when the Christchurch earthquake happened, considering the research that you've done, did that feel very sort of real to you? Did it make you sort of reflect on some of the work that you'd done? Um, I wished I was there. I actually quite enjoy earthquakes. 
when I was living in California, there were you know a number of them close by, and so I find them a, a quite interesting experience because they follow exactly what the mathematical models say will happen. Um, in the case of Christchurch, really people should have known that it would happen because Christchurch did have a history of earthquakes some time ago. Um, and this is often what happens with, with natural disasters is that people just forget. Um, for example, in Japan, I believe that there are markers which say don't build any closer to the ocean than this because this is where the tsunami reached. And that was a thousand years ago. But people forgot uh, because anything longer than the span of a human life is too long for us to really keep personal experience of. Um, and so with the volcano in Tonga, for example, every thousand years, this is something that happens. Um, but people have just forgotten. Um, we, don't, we don't live on that time scale. Right. I guess because the work that you do is sort of, you know, deeply rational, if you like, and it must be frustrating sometimes how irrational human beings are about things. Well, I'm, I'm no more rational than the next person. Um, but, you know, when you, when you have a deep interest in something, your, your point of view on it can be a little different from other people's. Um, so I can remember going to the beach with a, a bunch of fellow students when I was in high school. There was a huge bull sitting in the middle of the road and most people were going, ah, in horror. And the girl in the front seat was saying, oh, he's beautiful. <laughs> So take me back to your sort of first encounter with a computer, though. Was that at the University of Auckland? Auckland? Yeah. Well, the, f the, first, the first computing was not all that exciting because it took place with probably punched cards, but it may have been marked sense cards where you sort of put little marks on the cards indicating, you know, zeros and ones on it. Um, so we wrote little programs that way, and it would take several days to get the results back. Um, so it wasn't anything I was particularly interested in or inspired by. Right. Um, it was really only when I started to get my hands on interactive computing that I got interested in it. Um, interactive computing really wasn't available much in the early 70s. It was more towards the end of the 70s that these things became available. Um, and there was a computer in Auckland which was available in the night time, so I would go in at night time and stay all night um, and go to bed in the morning. And sort of tapping away and trying to figure trying things to out. Things, yeah. um, and so at the University of California, so at that time in what, like the 80s, what was this atmosphere like then? Um, when I arrived in Berkeley, I got a, a taxi from the airport and I asked the taxi driver what sort of things went on in Berkeley and he said anything you like and he was right so um, as well as the sort of you know academic environment there was also lots of other things going on it's always been a sort of political hothouse there although it had died down a little bit by the time I was there um, but cultural things you know there was a lot of great music going on I went to a lot of concerts um, Went to a lot of Grateful Dead concerts uh, and did a lot of hiking, things like that. Um, so, a as I said, I really wasn't that serious about being there at the beginning. Um, that really only came later. Mm -hmm. I guess at that point in time, that was kind of, you know, early stages of the development of the internet and computers being developed into, you know, PCs. And a bit of that work was happening on the University of California. Yeah, the, the, they had huge grants from Department of Defense to sort of build a lot of the basic infrastructure for um, the internet. Um, I think a lot of the uh, sort of pioneering work was done at Xerox Park, which was also in the Bay Area. Um, but the building of sort of practical computer networks and things was actually taking on the f ta taking place on the floor of the building that I was actually working on. 
um, and there were people on my floor who went on to um, found things like um, Sun Microsystems, which was a big computing company. The, uh, the guy who used to come around and fix our email program actually ended up being the uh, head of Google, um, Eric Schmidt. <laughs> wow. So kind of maybe looking back, it must feel a little bit surreal kind of being there at that time. Perhaps. Yeah, well, it felt fairly surreal at the time as well because, you know, it was clear that what was going on was very important work at the time. Right, okay, so you got a sense at that moment that this is going to be huge. Yeah, and in fact, I um, I talked to one of the young professors there, a guy called Jim Reeds, about um, what I should be doing, and I asked him about doing theoretical statistics and what he thought of it because he had a very good reputation in that area and he said I think it's silly I think you should get involved with computers right okay um, so it was clear at that point that there was going to be this sea change um, in what was going to happen yeah and so you decided um, you didn't want to stay in the states after you finished PhD decided to come back to New Zealand no I, I stayed in the US. I went from Berkeley to um, Yale University, which is on the East Coast. Um, stayed there for a while. Yale was sort of backward. Um, you know, it seemed to be the, the kind of place that old academics went to die. Um, so I was offered a job at MIT in Massachusetts, so went there for a few years. Um, and that was kind of an ideal job because I was in something called the Statistics Center, which had huge computing power and not much to do with it. So I basically got to play there. Um, and it was there I did, you know, a lot of the work that showed up later in, in work that I did. Mm. And so and but so there didn't feel like quite the same atmosphere of anything as possible there or Oh at, at MIT there certainly was. I mean it was just fabulous on any day of the week you could just look at the program for the week and find some fantastic talk by somebody amazing that you could go to. What are some examples? Um, the one I remember was, um, I'm trying to remember his name, James somebody who actually came up with the Gaia hypothesis um, that the world is basically a, a feedback system. Um, there were other great ones in computing as well. But, you know, I don't remember the, the names of the people because they just went on. It was an everyday experience to go along to them. Right. Um, okay, so did that for a, for a while and then you came back. To and then I came back to New Zealand, yeah. Um, I sort of felt the call of home. Uh, my parents were getting older, which is a reason that a lot of people seem to come back here. Mm -hmm. And so back to the stats department at the University of Yeah, I, I basically arrived here and said, give us a job. Um, uh, and the, the head of department there was a, uh, a very kind gentleman, Alistair Scott, and he made a place for me. And was that a mix of teaching and research work? Yeah, it was a standard academic lecturing position. So, you know, it was 50% teaching, 25% uh, research and 25% admin. That's the standard load that people have. And so we're talking late 80s, early 90s here? Uh, this was 1991, I think, when I started, yeah. Right, and so this was about the time that you met Robert Gentleman. Um, yes, that was a couple of years later, I think. Well, a year later, yeah, he was visiting from Canada at that point. Mm. We kind and of just was... passed each other in the corridors. We didn't really talk that much until about two weeks before he was supposed to go back to Canada. Um, and then he sort of stopped me in the corridor and said, we should write some software. Um, I'm easily led, so I said, fine, let's do it. Um, so we did a little bit of work, and then he went back to Canada. There was kind of a hiatus for a year, although we still continued doing some things. Uh, he came back in, I think it was 1993, and we got seriously down to work at that point. Mm. And so what was the sort of problem that you felt like you were solving at that point? Like, What was needed, you think, with the software that you were creating? Um, there were a couple of things. The main thing was that the program that we used for doing our actual statistical work uh, wasn't that great for big problems. Um, so the, in the um, 
the methodology for what's called memory management, which is you know how you store things in the computer and make use of them, wasn't that good in that program. So we thought that might be a thing to have a look at. Um, my original starting point was I thought I'd like to make a toolkit uh, for building statistical languages, um, and then that would sort of enable lots of experimentation. Um, but we kind of got sidetracked doing one of them rather than building a general structure for doing things. Right, okay. And then, but and it was quite also collaborative as well. Yeah, well, initially there was just the two of us, um, which in a way was very good because we hadn't discovered how to work at separate computers, so we both sat together at the same computer, one person typing, the other person looking over their shoulder at what they were doing and criticizing, making suggestions. Um, the effect of that was we, we developed a kind of mind meld where we could pretty much complete each other's sentences because we, we got so familiar with how the other person thought. Um, and the fact that we had to do it that way meant we developed a really solid understanding so that when we separated and when the group got larger, there was still this basic common understanding that we had of what we were doing and how we were going about it. Mm. And so to a, a layman, how would you explain what R is? Um, it's a tool that people who do statistics use to get their answers. Now, it differs from a lot of computing tools in that it's extensible. It, it was never designed to be a complete product. Instead, we um, built the capability to extend it to add new things. Um, so even though the, the amount of functionality that we built into it was quite small, because other people got interested and then contributed, it just grew and grew and grew. And now I think it's probably the most fully featured statistical software there is. Um, the last time I checked, I think there were something like 10,000 contributed applications that you could just grab a hold of and use for doing statistical work. Mm. How many people do you think use R today on a daily basis? We have no idea. Um, it's a question that's come up again and again since we started working on it. Because we just give it away and don't track where it goes, we have no idea how many copies get made. We know how many get downloaded, maybe, although that probably happens from different sites as well. My guess is millions, but I don't know how many million. And so about that giving away aspect of it, so it's open source. Can you tell me about what that means and why that was an important part of R? Uh, I really prefer the term free software, which is um, free as in freedom, not free as in beer. Uh, so the idea is you create software, you give it to people, and they are free to modify it and extend it in any way they like. Whereas with something like Microsoft Word, it's closed off, and so you can't actually go inside and make changes to it. Um, so R is distributed under what's called a copyleft, uh, which basically says, I will give the software to you. You can do whatever you want with it. You can give it to other people, but you can't restrict what they do with it. Um, so the term that's used is often, um, it's a virus. So it spreads itself. Um, because people just pass it on. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of movement that started, I guess, in the late 80s um, with Richard Stallman at MIT, who decided that he was sick of programs that had bugs in, it, in them and he couldn't fix them. So he decided he was going to build a whole alternative computing system that people could get into and fix. Um, so we bought into that. We did briefly think about making commercial software and we thought we might be successful enough to sell 10 copies and who the heck cares about that. Um, so we went the free software route and just let it spread itself basically. Right, so that, I, that probably explains its widespread nature today is that you know it was built to spread in a way. Yeah, 
um, and it continues to do so. Uh, there's, I mean, I don't really even follow all the things that people are doing with it now, but you'll find that there are people who have written programs to solve Sudoku. Um, I don't think there are any chess or checkers playing things, but there are all sorts of applications that you wouldn't have expected. Um, and that's one measure of success for a programming language. If it gets used for things you didn't, in your wildest dreams, expect, then it's been a success. Yes. So I, I read a profile of you um, in which you describe as success as an example of the rusting hulk model of software development. Can you explain what that means? Um, yes, that goes back to my PhD advisor and his time in New Zealand uh, where he described how you would get yourself a car in New Zealand. And his, his description is you go to the junkyard and you pull out some old junker and put it beside the road and stand beside it looking confused and puzzled and in need of help. And by the time the third person stopped to help you, you've probably got yourself a pretty good car. <laughs> Um, and so what happened with R was we pulled our horrible little piece of software out to the side of the internet and stood there looking hopeful and a lot of people came and helped and we together produced something pretty good. Did you at any point consider commercialising it after you sort of saw initial success? Did you think like, oh, let's make some money from this or no? Well, the licence really doesn't let you do that because any version of it that was out there was already free. Um, the other thing is because it was free, people came and collaborated with us, whereas if it had been commercial software, they wouldn't have done that. Um, so I remember we had one meeting in Vienna where uh, we were discussing with a commercial company collaboration with them, they had a similar product. And their manager came in and looked around the room and said, I can't afford to buy one programmer of the quality of any of the people in this room. Um, so people wouldn't, there was no amount of money that would make these people work for us, but they were perfectly happy to volunteer and contribute to a, a piece of free software. Mm. Did, you, did you sort of feel like in a, so obviously it, it, it makes sense in a practical way of being able to enable it to spread, but did you also feel in sort of, I don't know, like a moral way of, you know, this should be free, people should have access to it if they want to? Well, that, that, yeah, I mean, that's part of the, the free software idea is that um, software should be free, not just software, but information in general should be free. Um, you can understand why it, be why it might be necessary to buy a car because there's all the, the hardware and things in the car, whereas getting a piece of software, it's essentially free to copy. Um, so once you have it, there's no reason why you can't just make millions and millions of copies and spread them around. What impact has that had to the world that we live in today? Uh, the thing that matters to me is that it's had an impact in places that other commercial software wouldn't. So very early on with R, I got a letter from a researcher in tropical medicine um, in Central America who told me, you know, we don't have the budget to buy commercial software, so thank you for making this available. Um, and I've had similar letters from people in Africa as well. Um, so the fact that it's freely available, you know, is, and has made a difference to people like that is something that, that I'm quite proud of. Does it surprise you today how widespread its use is? Not today. It did in, oh, I guess about 2002, um, because we were still fairly new to the game and we were trying to guess, you know, how many users we had, we didn't really know. Now it's so widespread and you can find it on the internet. Um, when we first started out, people hated us for choosing the name R, right? Because you go and do a Google search on R and you can imagine how many results you'd get. Now it seems to be a bit more focused and you do find out about it. 
And so is it still a, a, an important component to the work that you do now or you've, you've moved on? Um, I use it. I'm not really a developer anymore. Um, so I tend to do um, consulting work in energy demand, electricity demand, um, and also software for forecasting. Um, the, the sort of forecasting energy demand, I was using R for that, but the, um, the new forecasting software I'm writing isn't. Um, it's in C sharp. So R is sort of just, you've, you've set it free, if you like, or perhaps yeah. you did that a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like a child, you know, you, you bring it up and you send it out into the world and you hope it does well, um, but then it's on its own. Um, and so you, a while ago you did some work with um, Linda Smith um, looking at Matauranga Māori or Indigenous knowledge and science. Can you tell me a bit about that work that you did with her? Yeah, I, well I was very lucky to be asked by Linda to be involved in that. I think partly because it, uh, it's uh, because I'm related to her husband. Um, so the, the project really was to try and bring Matarangi Māori and science together and to see where that was practical and where it was difficult. Um, so we had a series of meetings. Um, so there were people, holders of the Māori knowledge and there were scientists, typically Māori scientists who got together to discuss issues and look at what was going on. Um, I think it was a very interesting project because um, we found that we eventually got to the point of opera, you know, switching views to the opposing side and arguing effectively from that side. So I can remember sort of, you know, um, Maori knowledge holders arguing for genetic engineering while I was steadfastly against it. Um, uh, we also went to look at other places. So uh, we had a trip to Hawaii to look at sort of indigenous knowledge there and um, also some of the scientific work that was going on there. You know, they have these huge telescopes up on top of the mountain there, the sacred mountain for Hawaiians. Um, so we went with um, a local kahuna up to the top of the mountain and he was describing the traditional sites on the way and how it, the, uh, the telescopes being on top of the mountain was a real affront um, to local Hawaiians. Um, we also looked at fish farms and navigation and things like that as well. Um, it was a, a very nice trip and it was good to get insight into a slightly different culture. I remember going to some of the museums there and you'd see these faces and they could have been Maori from New Zealand. Um, and the, the, the similarity of language was also interesting as well. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned about how the indigenous knowledge holders were arguing from you know, the scientific point of view and, and vice versa. I guess to you, to you, did that sort of illustrate, you know, there is, a, there is an overlap here as opposed to these opposing sides. Yeah, like. well, the, the, the meetings were designed to break down walls. So there was a good exchange of information. And the, the sort of opposing viewpoints uh, I was talking about was really part of an exercise about how would you handle genetic engineering in New Zealand. Um, and a lot of people saw the pros and a lot of people saw the cons and they didn't always line up where you expected them to. Um, so it was, an, you know, it was an interesting abstract exercise. So what were your conclusions that you personally took away from the work that you were doing with Linda Smith around Matauranga Māori and science? I found value in all knowledge that was presented and considered. Um, and I think importantly that the other people there, traditional knowledge holders and the scientists felt the same way. Um, was there any particular fact or anything like that that I took away? No, I don't think so. It was really more about 
attitudes and developing tolerance, which I think is really what the, what the program was about. Linda described it initially, the meeting space as being a liminal space, uh, which basically means you come without baggage. Um, and that really seemed to work in that particular program. Mm. And so today there are question, questions happening, not just in New Zealand, but everywhere, you know, in many university spaces in, in the world around the intersections of Indigenous knowledge and stuff that has been produced through the scientific method. Do you have any thoughts that you can share about, you know, the nature of those conversations and how it's being talked about? Well, all knowledge is good. I think, and needs to be seen within its own framework. I don't think you can view knowledge as competitive. Um, well, I mean, within a particular discipline, you may have competing theories, but you know, the disciplines themselves shouldn't be regarded as competitive. Uh, so to talk about equal status or non-equal status, I think is a red herring. Um, the important thing is that people avail themselves of the knowledge, um, make use of it. So there's been a lot of controversy currently in New Zealand about um, scientific paradigms and traditional paradigms. Um, I, I have a certain amount of sympathy for the people who put pen to paper about that because a lot of teaching has diluted the mathematical sciences and hard sciences. And so we've got a problem already with dilution of those and I think it pays to be concerned about whether or not you may be diluting those further. Um, so while I think it's good to introduce traditional knowledge, if the price of that is losing some of the scientific capability that we have already, I would feel troubled by that. Hmm. Are you worried about the fact that people are being investigated for expressing their opinions about Absolutely, that? although that is something that tends to happen these days. Um, and if you put your head above the parapet, I guess you've got to expect to get shot at. Um, and, you know, these, these are adults who knew what they were doing, so I guess they probably expected what they got. Mm. And so do you think that intersection of mātauranga Māori and um, scientific work, is that, that's the key, the exploring that intersection is the key to getting more rangatahi into science, math and technology, or not so much? Um, yes, possibly. I'm, I'm really in two minds about involving rangatahi. Um, to some extent, science, that is research science, is really for dilettantes and people who have the means to do it. I mean, that's always been the way for science. Most famous scientists were wealthy people who dabbled in science. Um, so perhaps the first priority should be to establish an economic base. And so if somebody was looking for a career, I would say um, become a lawyer, become a sportsman, um, get into entertainment, you know, the rest will follow eventually when there's the means to do it. So if, if some kid has a particular strong interest in science, by all means encourage them. Um, but I'm not sure it's productive to try and encourage everyone to do it. Not everyone can be a scientist. Um, and I think, you know, Maori knowledge also stands on its own. Um, the, the difference between the sort of traditional 
Greek-based science and um, Maori science was explained to me once by somebody telling me that for Greek science, the fundamental question is how meaning by what mechanism, what causes things. So you tend to drill down to find detail and look at things. Whereas Maori science was based on the, the question why, meaning to what end. So why do these things happen? What flows from that? So that leads to a much more holistic view of the world and science. Um, so things like ecology would fit much more, I think, into that worldview. Um, but something like mathematics, well, it sits out there on its own. You know, even for most people in science, it's a mystery. Um, so what do you think about sort of the big social media tech companies and their influence? <laughs> um, well... I don't do social media, other than to keep in contact with my sister occasionally. Um, I think the fact that they are run by big business means that they are not a force for good, they are a force for making money for a few people. Um, I'm not impressed by the divisiveness that they bring about. Um, I don't think they're a force for good, um, and I just I stay away from them. Um, how do you feel about you know the um, the fact that your software is in use at all of these companies? Um, it's a tool. Um, I'm sure they use pencils there too, and <laughs> pens and paper. Uh, any tool can be used for good or bad purposes. Um, it's their responsibility what they do with it. I think the tool is rather niche and it's probably not being used at places like Facebook and Google to harvest information and to increase their revenue stream. They probably need much more specialised tools for that. Do you, does it worry you that how much we sort of live our lives online and how much data um, is held by various for-profit tech companies. Yeah, but then I'm an old fuddy-duddy, so it's not the world that I grew up in. Um, I actually like keeping myself private. Um, but other people feel differently. Other people are quite prepared to make the, the deal where they sign away their information in return for services they might get. Um, I tend to defeat the information, try and defeat the information gathering process as much as I can. Uh, By just giving away fake information or like, I don't know, how do you do that? Um, I try to sign up anonymously or to deliberately produce bad information for people. Um, I like to turn my phone off when I go to places. Um, just try to disrupt the process as much as I can. Do you worry about how much is information is kept in the cloud? I do, but perhaps not for the reasons that most people do. Um, one of the, the real worries with information is that it is so fragile and transient. Um, whereas we, we have clabbed clay tablets from, you know, 5,000 years ago recording facts about that time. In 5,000 years, there will probably be nothing of what is going on at the moment. The world will have gone dark, basically. So if people come to look back, there won't be anything to look at to see what's going on. And that doesn't necessarily need to happen slowly. You know, if we were hit by a particularly large space weather event that could wipe out all computers around the world or a significant number of them um, and then the information's just gone. Mm. Do you think that's likely to, to happen? I think it will happen. The question is when, as with all of these things. Um, would you consider yourself to be a digital anarchist? 
Well, from early age, I've always been a philosophical anal um, anarchist. I don't like rules and being told what to do. I think people can come together to achieve things. Um, so if I had to describe myself, I would describe myself as a communist anarchist, not in the sense of the Soviet Union, but in the sense of doing things communally. Um, digital, well, perhaps not so much. Um, it's not a particular aspect of my life. It's how I am in all aspects of my life. Would you describe yourself as anti-capitalist? Um, hmm. I would describe myself as anti-capitalist excess, I guess. So, mm -hmm. um, I guess I would tend to feel most comf comfortable in a social democracy um, and not in any sort of laissez-faire capitalist society. When you look back at the career that you've had, would you do it all again? Um, possibly. Um, there are other things that I would have liked to have done. Um, I would have liked to have tried carpentry, cabinet making, something like that. Um, you know, as in any life, it had its ups and it had its downs, but you take the good with the bad, I guess. Um, so I'm happy with the way things turned out. I think to seek a different way, you would have to be significantly unhappy, probably. Hmm. So, oh, can you tell me about your tattoos as well? Um, yeah, I have a couple. My, my daughter does tattoos, so as birthday presents, she's given me a couple of them. Um, this one here is Euler's equation, which is um, e to the i pi plus 1 is equal to 0. It sort of relates most of the fundamental mathematical constants. Um, and it's really to do with angles around a circle. Um, it's named after Leonard Euler, who I can trace back through my academic whakapapa. Um, so that the way you do this is you trace back to your PhD advisor, who traces back to his, who traces back to his. And so I can trace back to a number of these people. Um, this one here is actually the motto from the University of California. Fiat Lux, which is not a small Italian car, it's uh, the beginning of the Bible, you know, let there be light um, in Latin. So I plan to get a few more of these uh, as my, you know, display my academic whakapapa. Cool. Um, and so tell me about the future. Are you you're doing a bit of consulting at the moment? Are you kind of just going to keep keep on with that? Um, I'm doing a bit of consulting, but at the same time, I'm getting my house here ready for sale, you know, painting, gardening, that sort of thing. Um, I'm planning to move to the far north and um, garden and fish and get kaimoana um, and keep a low profile, I guess. Many, um, many computers around or? Uh, if you go far enough, then you don't have too many internet options, I guess. So, um, I mean, I'll probably always have a phone. I might have a computer, but um, the idea would be to get offline as much as possible and get back to the real world. It's an interesting bookend because you mentioned about how at the start of your life that nature was very important to you. So it's sort of like a, a nice beginning and, and ending sort of. Yeah, well, it's one of those things I've always planned to do, but sort of life got in the way, I guess. Mm -hmm.